2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favourable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered round him, so he got in a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling them many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it in his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell in the shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the, the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. Since they didn't have very deep roots, they died. Other seed fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants so they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they sprouted, grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60, even a hundred times as much as it had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears should hear and listen and understand. This is the Gospel of Christ. everyone. Hello. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Over the last few weeks, I kept seeing a book lying on the bookshelf right in my line of vision from the sofa. It had this title, Evangelism Through the Local Church, in bold lettering. I wondered if I should reshelve it somewhere else. Maybe it was too much in the face for visitors. But I didn't, and it kept sitting there. Finally, I took it down and put it on my desk. Maybe it was there for a reason. And maybe that reason was to do with preaching this morning. So last weekend, I started reading it and taking notes, adding my penny worth here and there. After doing this for about an hour, I was suddenly overcome with emotion. I knew God had placed the book there for me to use today. 
from the moment several years ago that I picked it up at work in Nelson from a pile that had been culled from the library. I overflowed with tears of thanks and praise and I can still feel that emotion today as I think of it. This is the book. I will lend it to our church library in case anyone would like to spend some time with it and I sure recommend that you do. Yes, it's a tome, but it's one you can't put down once you start reading, I can tell you that. Our topic today is fruitful evangelism. What is evangelism? It's a sharing of the good news of Jesus in any and every situation of our lives. Mission has a slightly different but similar meaning. It means going out into the world to share our faith. We haven't got to go far, for the world is pressing in around us, as Ron told us last week. Why is evangelism often unfruitful? Unfruitful. Jesus was teaching about this in the parable of the sower we have heard today. In the field of the lives of human beings, God's seed will not grow in all who receive it. But those who receive it will in turn become sowers and they will produce fruit for the kingdom in other people's lives, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, even a hundredfold. In the field of the lives of human beings, God's seed will not grow in all who receive it. Sometimes God's seed sown in the human field may not bear fruit. Sometimes it doesn't bear fruit in our own lives. Does the seed not grow in us because we are hard ground? Are our minds closed to producing fruit for the kingdom? Maybe we don't see ourselves as evangelists. Maybe we think of evangelism as something done by those people who are more knowledgeable and confident than us, who know what to say and won't be embarrassed to open their mouths. Or does the seed not grow in us because we are thorny ground? Are we too tired, too distracted, too busy? We think it's too much of a task. We think it's all up to us and we're already worn out and busy with other things, work things, family things, church things. Does any of this ring a bell with you? Take a moment to talk to your neighbours and somebody nearby you for a few minutes, just to have a talk about how this might ring a bell with you. Go for it. Okay, does it ring a bell with you? Uh, th those reasons why the seed may not have fallen on the fertile ground. Is it because uh, we don't see ourselves as evangelists or is it because we are too tired, too distracted, too busy? All right. Or anything else you think of? Repeat it again. Discuss where this rings a bell with you. Either of those uh, ideas about why the seed may not grow or there might be something else. Okay. Uh, 
when you're ready, if any of you would like to share uh, how it rings a bell with you, uh, Lurks has a microphone. Any of you would like to share with the congregation how this rings a bell with you? You don't have to. You don't have to. <laughs> you might just want to put your hand up if you think that applies to you. No? Anyone want to share? Yes. No, you need it for the deaf people, oh. like me. Hello. Hello. Um, we talked about how um, sometimes, the, I know this is probably right, but thorny ground, it's about mm. how the busyness of life just gets mm. in the way of having time to sit down and have conversations with yeah. people. Yeah. Yes. That's really serious, isn't it? Yes. And we get too task-driven by all the things we're trying to fit into our lives. Okay. Anyone else want to share anything? Before we go on, Liz. One of the prayers that Ron and I pray frequently is um, uh, one that came from David Watson in England, give us eyes to see and grace to seize every opportunity for you. Mm. Now, mm. we're not always good at that. Mm. I suppose I think of myself more as a witness and by the way I live my life hopefully, mm. and at our little place called Castle Hill Village, we've got to know some people reasonably well, and one couple who were there, they actually started up some years ago a group whereby people could share what made them tick. It was called Exchanges. And I remember the night that Ron spoke, and of course spoke about his faith, and shared his story. And there were two people in the group that we've got to know very well whose faces revealed the fact that they were totally shut off. Uh -huh. They were determined, even though we're good friends with them, not to let anything that Ron said impinge on them at all. Now, the other people in the group weren't like that. They were listening in a much more open way. And I guess the parable yes. that was read yeah. this morning is a reminder of that. Yes. And it's, it's we not seem only to about us, it's encounter about the people out there. Yes, yes. A lot of hard ground, mm. I guess. Yeah. And maybe that's part of the secular society. Yes. That we're yes. In. And we need to discern the people who are not hard ground. Yes. yes. I'm talking about yeah. that later. It's good. Thank you, Liz. Anyone else want to? Yeah, I'm just conscious in our relationships with neighbours and family members who we see from time to time that we get an idea of where their position is on matters of faith and um, ideas about things. And if we just keep our antennae up and our um, connection with the Lord as to what might be good to say from one time to the next, um, we see things changing and... Mm that's these places where we are in our neighbor among our neighbors and in our families and um, just keeping aware of any changes that there may be in our positions mm. as we know and share mm. not wanting to blow things by saying inappropriate things knowing the position of the other person but just seeking the Lord to move things along mm. in the direction he wants Yes, yeah, so prayer is a really important underpinning of that. Yes. Uh, first we carry on. Um, I love that concept that Vicky presents about being sensitive to where the person's at and watching as we see what God's yes. doing. Those of us who had the privilege of going through LISAC course last year, one of the statements that absolutely grounded in my mind is they'd done some research over there in England and found that you have 10 conversations the average response is one in ten will be ready for whatever that is. It takes the pressure off of, oh, what have I done wrong the other yes. eight or nine yes. put on the blank yeah. face that Liz talked about. It's just keeping going, keeping going, seeing what God's doing and 
focusing on praying, especially for that one in ten, mm. that God will help us to be sensitive to who's ready to respond mm. to that to the the God story at that time. Yes, indeed. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I I have always found evangelism a scary word, I have to say. Um, Except when it seems to happen by itself or by God's self. For it's not just up to us, and isn't that a great comfort to know? It's up to the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit's work in our midst, in our church. We have a God who is passionate for evangelism, passionate for mission, who has chosen to work through the church. If we are saying things to ourselves about how hard evangelism is, is it because we feel alone and vulnerable? Because it doesn't feel like a church team effort? Because our church doesn't seem to be focused on evangelism? It's easy for a church to be that way if it is focused on maintenance, keeping the finances coming in, fixing the building, having enough people to do the various jobs. They're all important things, yes. But they can focus a church away from mission and evangelism. In the first, <coughs> sorry, in the first four of my 10 years in Ireland as a parish rector, also known as vicar, I was in charge of a group of three rural churches. They were beautiful churches, still are, set in lovely countryside, and the people were lovely people, mostly. Ministering in the Church of Ireland is quite an experience. Uh, I noticed that one of these churches, at one of these churches, they would get out a little notice board before the service and lean it on the font which was at the back of the church near the door. I asked them why they didn't put it on the wall in the porch where visitors could see it. I knew that people came from time to time from a mooring at a nearby lake and the church would be locked outside of service times. Oh, the weather would come in and ruin it, they said. Anyway, we all know what's going on. A church like that may not think it's closed to mission, but it was literally just that, closed. So how can a church move from maintenance to mission? What does a church look like that's open to God's work of mission and fruitful evangelism? First of all, such a church is open to change. Remember what Ron said last week? The people we want to reach do not share our inherited customs or find security in them. They have voted with their feet. They don't want to be where most of us currently are. Ron, I don't know, uh, your book was going to be available this week. Uh, it's not, you're just hoping. All right, watch, watch that space. It'll be at the back of the church soon and make sure you get a hold of it. Um, because that's really a valuable read for us. These people are not necessarily unbelievers. They just don't do church. And church may be a deeply alien environment to them. What would these people need from a church? How might we need to change to be a place that could meet those needs. Second, a missional church is open to faith. It trusts God with its future. Its people have a passion to speak about Jesus, to testify about what God has done and is doing in their lives. It was wonderful to hear some people at 9.30 talking about just that. Third, a missional church 
is open to prayer. Prayer undergirds everything that is done. Seeking the Lord is coming, been coming out in what you've already been saying. Seeking the Lord as to how to go forward to locate the people out there, to how to discern who they are. Praying that we'll be equipped, that we'll be strengthened, that we'll be in tune with the Holy Spirit. Fourth, a missional church is open to training and equipping for mission and evangelism. Fruitful evangelism is not about being dropped in at the deep end with, help, what do I say here? It's about evangelism that is equipped and confident. Hands up, who would consider coming to a short course on sharing your faith if we were to offer it? Quite a few. That's good. Being equipped and confident, we need to know how to share our faith. This, this, the scariness of not knowing is, is a big obstacle. Fifth, a missional church is open to love. A climate of love reaches out. Love is the key to outreach. Being concerned for others. Wanting to be friend. Wanting to, them to share in the good news. Wanting to comfort. Wanting to heal where it hurts. Sixth, a missional church is open to dynamic worship. But that's John's topic next week. We are looking forward to. Now for the how question. How do we do fruitful evangelism? Just take a moment to share with people around you an experience you've had in sharing your faith. Just take a minute to talk to someone near you in the group or a couple, or whatever, about an experience you've had in sharing your faith. Go for it. If anyone would like to share with the uh, wider congregation, Lurks has the microphone. Just put up your hand if you've got a story you would like to share with the wider group when you get to that point. Anyone thinking if they would like to just tell more people about what they've been talking about? There you go. Lurks, can you? This, I'm sorry, your name escapes me, but this lady in the pink. Mary. Mary over here wants to. Hi. I, a few years ago, worked with refugees from Kurdistan. And um, we worked with these beautiful Muslim people for a long time. And one day, this chappie said to me, why on earth do you do this? Because we, you know, have different lifestyles and all this history. And there, I gave my testimony. And that felt the right thing to do. So I feel like if you have compassion and reach out to the whosoever, that's mission. And then you get an opportunity to... Give to an share, a, give yeah. an account because of the they hope asked. That is in you. Yes. yes, I didn't push it. They asked why I did it, mm -hmm. or Sid and I, my husband, mm. Mm. we did it together. Great, and that was lovely. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Mary. And yes, some of the young men who were Muslim are still in relation to this girl today, and mm. they are now Christian. Three of them. Oh, praise mm. the Lord! Yeah, and there's one young oh. man in the middle of the North Island who calls me his mama. Mm. I'm his mama, and we talk still oh and so I love that yeah oh what a wonderful story 
So, Thelma, are you wanting to? Uh, no? Who was? Someone else wanting to share on this? You don't have to. It's just if the spirit leads you. Vicky's, Vicky wants to. If it was somebody else, I, I jumped it. I, I spent a lot of time um, with um, people at the Marae and also at Aranui um, Salvation Army with a strong Māori emphasis, and I've been reading some of their journey in the blend of Māori Christianity and other Māori preoccupations with ancestry and, and everything. And at our Friday group, which is an Atarangi language group, we encourage actually also to do our pepeha. And um, I do mine in line with a Christian Māori woman I heard a few years ago on Rima in Māori Language Week. And you don't always do it in full, depending on whether you need to be brief because of some time constraint. But in our Friday group, we're encouraged to make it different each time and to do a wakatoki at the beginning. And um, so um, our teacher wasn't there the, the week before last because she had too many other pressures happening and she apologised. But I had mine sorted out and um, it was a different one. And um, I said to someone else, I'd like to do that one sometime. And she didn't think it was a suitable <laughs> in the context. But I said... Um, in Māori, I said, um, when I think of the gospel stories um, from the Saviour, um, this proverb comes to mind, tama tu, tam ora, tama no, tama mate. The one who stands lives, and the one who sits down gets sick or dies. And just this thing of making a stand for the Lord was the context there, because I use my pepeha to do that as well. And so that's why little story about that particular wakatoki and you know he says if you deny me well I won't want to know you and if you um, declare um, your knowledge of me then you'll live thanks Vicky is that everyone anyone else want to ah there's just a quick little story I learnt a long time ago as a student as a young woman, I had a travelling job and I was travelling around the South Island for a Christian organisation. <coughs> and those were the days where it wasn't dangerous to pick up hitchhikers. And I remember I must have listened to a sermon on evangelism because <laughs> I picked someone up and I gave it to them, the gospel I mean, <laughs> and absolute no response whatsoever. So I remember when I dropped them off that I felt, well, that was a waste of time and, and of course I had a lot of self-doubt afterwards. But I came to realise that what I had done was um, speak to them about Jesus because of my need to do so. And instead of listening to where they were at, and what so yes. I, I thought yeah. I'm not going to do that again instead I need to pray and the next time I picked somebody up I had prayed about it and I felt sensed it was the right thing to do I picked that person up the conversation went very naturally because of the job I was doing it was easy to talk about my faith and there was a total response. Mm -hmm. And just the difference between trying to do it on my own and the way you mentioned, mm -hmm. and instead listening and moving with the Holy Spirit as much as oh. I could. That's, that's great. Thanks, Liz. That's exactly on the spot. Yes, indeed. Oh. OK. Is that? Oh, Tim. I was warned this group would want to carry on and on. <laughs> <I'm>, <coughs> the, the hitchhiking yeah. story reminded me of um, our picking up of a dangerous hitchhiker, Liz. We picked him one up um, just um, a few weeks back when we were on our way back from Alex. And he was on the side of the road in Amaru and he had a bike and a bike trailer oh, and he no. was hitchhiking. No. And I thought, what chance is he 
to be picked up by oh, anybody sorry. with a trailer and a bike and him. <laughs> but we just happened to have a bike carrier in the car and space in the back. So I thought, well, that's us. So I picked him up. And he was, a, he was from Argentina. And uh, he'd done a stint on the ice and he ra ranged around the world running away from, I would imagine, lots of things. And he was about 50. And we talked generally and he was, uh, he, I said, we thought, oh, well, here he is in our car, uh, grateful for a lift. So um, I said to him, you know, where are you at with God? And he said, uh, well, um, nowhere in particular. Um, God's either finding it really hard to get through to me or I'm not in a good place to hear from him. Mm -hmm. And that's probably where it sat. And we just travelled, we called him to a place and then we dropped him in Hagley Park where he wanted to be. And at the end I just said, look, I hope uh, you'll find the God you're looking for and that he can get through to you. And that's it. But there we are. Just an opportunity. I don't know where that all went. But yeah, well, all, the often all we can do to follow up is to pray that yep. this will indeed happen, that we would have sown the seed by saying what we've said. Yeah. Um, I'm going to tell a slightly different story. This is from when John was sick and dying. So, um, oh. Kathy Howe, many of you will remember Kathy Howe. So, she um, came in just about every day and sat with John and I. And a lot of the district nurses who come in on a daily basis, they're Filipino, so they're Christians, but there's also a lot of them that are um, Chinese and Taiwanese and even a few um, Europeans. And Kathy and I were a little bit naughty because it was my home. And so when these district nurses came in, we would share our testimonies. We'd be talking amongst each other, and the nurses had to listen. And they had no option because they were working in our house. And it was, I mean, I processed everything at that stage through talking, and it's the closest I've ever felt to God was during that time. But mm. when a nurse comes into your house, or if you're a sick person and you've got people tending to you, there is no better opportunity to, sh to mm. share mm. And your testimony because um, you're the patient, and it doesn't matter what the um, eth the the religious background of the people tending to you are, they're there to look after you and if part of looking after you is them listening to you, it's because it's such an intense time mm. and God is so present that all you can do is overflow with all of your God stories. Mm. Oh, thank you Heather. Okay, so I believe there are four actions to fruitful evangelism. Pray, equip, connect, invite. That's pray, equip, connect, invite. Prayer is the beginning and the end and the whole way through. Praying for God to open up opportunities Help us to discern those opportunities. Praying for the equipping needed. Being alert to prayer opportunities with people. Could you believe that God wouldn't answer such prayer? Second, equip. Equip through focused group sessions on how to share faith. We need to provide those opportunities for people to be equipped to learn how to share their faith. Connect. Create bridges from where seekers are. They may be coming to our church programs, such as Repair Cafe and Mainly Music. God has sown seed on some fertile ground out there. How do we identify the seekers? We can do this by asking three sorts of questions. First question, who are you? Ask them about themselves. 
Listen to their stories. We've been hearing about this. Don't rush in with your testimony. Listen to them first. Second question, where are you in terms of faith? If you sense openness to a spiritual dimension to their lives, then you may have a seeker. Knowing how to ask this question is where equipping comes in. Third question, why don't you invite them to an event or to a group? And this is the fourth action, invite. Have we had these actions? Four actions, pray, equip, connect, invite. Note it's the fourth action. You might not even get to it. I mean, listening to your stories on a given occasion, it might, we might not get to that. In other situations, we are able to invite. We do get through to that point, yes. But it's the fourth action, it's not the first. It comes after the connection has been made. We need to take on board that fruitful evangelism does not start with the invitation. A church in Swindon in the UK did a door knocking program in their neighborhood to invite people to an event they were running. They didn't get past the knocking as the doors got shut in their face until they decided simply to ask people, was there anything they would like prayer for? Complete turnaround. Almost everyone wanted prayer. Out of that came faith conversations and acceptance of the invitations. When it comes to inviting, remember church may be deeply alien to the people we want to invite. A worship service may not be the best thing, unless it's particularly geared, such as messy church for preschool families. A small group or a coffee morning may be better, or bite the bullet and plan an alpha course Fruitful evangelism is God's work. Through the work of the Spirit, it will happen as we pray, equip, connect, invite. Let us pray. Lord God, when you give to us, your servants, any great matter to do, grant us also to know that it's not the beginning but the continuing of it until it is thoroughly finished which yields the true glory. As with Timothy, give us the patience, the perseverance, the clear-mindedness, the good preparation and the gift of encouragement to carry out our ministry fully, to do the work of fruitful evangelists in this church, in the power of your spirit, and in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're now going to sing.